Medistand. Understanding Medicine. I am Professor Azizur Rahman, and today we are going to start a series of lectures on ischemic heart disease. There will be approximately four or five of them, and of course, it's a very vast subject, but it is very, very important for both undergraduate and postgraduate students. And we will stay within the scope of internal medicine. Those who are specializing in cardiology, they can of course read more about it. And the first part is the risk factor and how this disease develops. So today we're going to cover that part. Uh, what is meant by risk factors? I think uh, it is not exactly equivalent to etiology. Etiology is something which there is one-to-one -one relationship. For example, if there is mycobacterium tuberculosis, there would be TB. And if there is no mycobacterium tuberculosis, there won't be TB. When we talk about the risk factors, the relationship is not that simple. The risk factor means there are certain conditions or certain diseases which only increase the chances of developing another complication and in this case uh, ischemic heart disease and then pathogenesis how these risk factors they become a disease we will talk about this briefly and of course very important how can we prevent this from happening ischemic heart disease is very bad disease can devastate one's disease the one's family's disease but it is preventable because we know the risk factors we know how this thing develops and if we intervene and if we intervene early enough we can actually prevent ischemic heart disease there are various levels we can intervene we will discuss them shortly now how this thing develops uh, basically ischemic heart disease is the consequence of atherosclerosis and what is atherosclerosis? It is progressive narrowing of blood vessels. And actually, it is not the just the narrowing. It ultimately something happens which immediately leads to complete or near complete occlusion. And so one has risk factors. And at this level, of course, one is expected to be asymptomatic. All right. And then this very, very slowly, very progressively, gradually develops into atherosclerosis. And again, at this stage, one is likely to be asymptomatic. Maybe somebody may have some subtle symptoms, like somebody may have angina, but no major symptoms. But then suddenly something happens that leads to rupture of that atheroma. Atheroma, which is causing a narrowing of blood vessels, maybe 50%, 60%, even 70%, not, not causing any ischemia, but suddenly uh, that atheroma ruptures or there is hemorrhage into that atheroma and that leads to sudden clot formation and there is then symptoms, I think, coming at rest. And then this could result in an acute event, which could be an acute myocardial infarction unstable angina or sometime it may be just sudden death so this is the sequence of events and of course we can prevent it from happening if we act early enough ideally we should screen our people for any risk factors particularly those patients those individuals who have family history uh, and they should be screened for these uh, for these risk factors and they should be controlled now, this is another cartoon, I think, uh, uh, explaining the same thing. You have risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and then high lipids. And when we are born, our blood vessels are very neat. Of course, we know that this atherosclerosis process starts very early. And there are some studies indicating that, that this could actually start in utero before we are born but it actually starts very early. So initially the vessels are very, very nice, lined by uh, endothelium, very smooth, but then these fat cells, they, the smooth cells are attracted, the macrophages, they imbibe fat, 
they become foam cells they aggregate and then they make these big big plaques which are covered by smooth uh, endothelium but later on this could become rough and this could become unstable and this could rupture and once it ruptures then of course a raw surface will be exposed and the raw surface will attract platelet and fibrinogen and that will make a clot and of course nature's attempt is to repair a damaged uh, surface uh, but this could be actually counterproductive in an attempt to repairing that damaged surface of uh, uh, atheroma actually it results in complete occlusion of the vessel now same would apply on brain vessels uh, we are discussing basically ischemic heart disease but the same atherosclerotic process same uh, rupture of atheroma clot formation also results in in stroke now basically the atherosclerosis is narrowing of blood vessels and it could lead to any problem depending upon which vessel uh, is affected uh, we are talking about the ischemic heart disease so coronaries once coronaries are affected it would result in ischemic heart disease in subsequent lectures we will discuss various types of ischemic heart disease and other aspects but today just mentioning that ischemic heart disease is one of the manifestations of atherosclerosis and then other one is cva cardio cerebrovascular accident uh, the ischemic one and you know out of 180 percent of the strokes are ischemic there could also be a uh, lacunar infarction but because of atherosclerosis there is involvement of a major vessel resulting in major stroke then it could also lead to uh, narrowing of peripheral vessels and initially it may be asymptomatic then it may cause what we call intermittent claudication and then again if there is further uh, progression it could result in gangrene and sometimes we might have to do amputation then renal artery disease uh, not traditionally classified uh, as atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease but now we know that atheroma can affect any vessel and it could also affect renal vessels so if there is a person who is hypertensive and suddenly became refractive to treatment i think you could suspect that the atherosclerotic narrowing of uh, renal artery uh, prevalence it is very prevalent and we do not have exact uh, estimates in our country but we know it is fairly common but i think there are some important things which i would like to mention it is one of the commonest if not the commonest cause of mortality morbidity and mortality of the modern life it is one of the commonest uh, in all societies and in south asia in in country like ours it is common it may be actually commoner than in west and it occurs at a young age and disease tends to be more severe and diffuse so this is very surprising although uh, our diet may be less rich in uh, as compared to western people uh, but because of the genetic factors because of inherent insulin resistance because of some other problems uh, the ischemic heart disease in South Asia is not only common it occurs at a younger age and disease tends to be more severe especially in diabetic patients and mostly what is responsible for premature ischemic heart disease is our changing lifestyle uh, there has been major change in our lifestyle uh, physical activity component is very markedly reduced there are very few people who actually do exercise and the component of physical activity in our normal work has also reduced because everything has gone on automation so i think that is one factor and number two our food intake has increased and food is not only really has increased in the quantity but it has also become more energy dense so i think these factors uh, have then uh, 
played a role to bring coronary artery disease at a younger age in our part of the world. And since poor education, especially poor health education, people are not exactly aware of this preventive uh, strategy. Very poor concept. Now, uh, most people, they have no idea about the prevention. And once they develop an acute coronary event, then they would be willing to do anything. Of course, that might also not be sustainable, but very few people do anything about the prevention of coronary artery disease, ischemic heart disease. Although I think even the educated people, they know what are the factors, but they, they, they are unable to control them. So that is the problem. Now, risk factors we have already defined that are certain conditions which can predispose uh, to ischemic heart disease. It is not must that if you have a risk factor, you would definitely develop ischemic heart disease. And it is also true that if you do not have any known risk factor, that you would not develop a coronary heart disease. That is not true. But having risk factors obviously increase the chances of having uh, developing coronary heart disease. And it also depends how many risk factors and what is the magnitude of those risk factors or what is the duration of those risk factors. So they all would add up to increase the chances of developing coronary artery disease. Uh, risk factors are typically classified into two groups. Unmodifiable uh, is a self-explanatory. We know that there is a risk factor, that there is, but there isn't anything that we can do about it. Uh, male gender, for example, we know that ischemic heart disease is slightly commoner in men as compared to women. Uh, women, their risk is equivalent, becomes equivalent to that of men after the menopause. But before that, they are somewhat protected. Uh, then the family history, uh, those who have family history of ischemic heart disease in parents or in siblings, that is very important. But I think having family history in a very old age might not be relevant. It has to be at a younger age. And by that, I mean that if your uh, mother develops coronary artery disease at the age of 65 or younger, or your father had developed coronary artery disease at the age of 55 or younger, that would be considered premature. Similarly, your siblings. I think in, in South Asia, uh, the figures are 55 for women and 45 for men. So if that is the case, that means you are particularly prone to develop coronary artery disease. This may be because of some factors which are actually modifiable. Family history is not modifiable, but if this family history is because of hyperlipidemia, that can be modified. Then is the aging. Uh, of course, uh, even if there are no risk factors at all, Aging itself is a risk factor. With time, our blood vessels become narrow, and then ultimately, uh, even without risk factors, one can develop coronary artery disease. So, more important than unmodifiable is the modifiable, because this is where our role is. This is where our role as physicians is, and this is where our role uh, as, a, as a community members is. Uh, dyslipidemia. Now, please note down. I use the word dyslipidemia. Previously, we used to call it hyperlipidemia. We call it dyslipidemia because there could be uh, quantitative abnormalities and there could be qualitative abnormalities which can cause uh, ischemic heart disease and we can modify it. Then hypertension is one of the most, I think the commonest uh, risk factor for coronary artery disease and definitely modifiable by appropriate intervention. Then smoking, uh, I think this is perhaps the one of the worst things mankind has invented for uh, ourselves. So smoking, depending upon uh, the degree of smoking and the duration of smoking, the risk would be increased. And of course, we, we can modify it. Uh, if somebody has been smoker for say 10 years, uh, some damage would be already there, but we can now definitely quit smoking to, to stop further risk. 
than diabetes. Uh, you might be wondering that why diabetes is quite down the list, although diabetes is one of the biggest risk factors. But because diabetes is actually a complex disease, diabetes has got associated hypertension and that is countered here. Diabetes has associated dyslipidemia that would be countered here. So that is why diabetes, if we take diabetes just like hyperglycemia, it would be in, down the list. But this is actually one of the common risk factors. Uh, there, is a, there was a time we used to say that having diabetes is like having coronary artery disease. Although now we know that that is slightly an overstatement, having diabetes for at least 10 years is equivalent to having coronary artery disease. So it's very important. Central obesity, uh, uh, because having fat in the abdomen in our viscera is metabolically active and that correlates with metabolic syndrome and that correlates with ischemic heart disease. So these are the risk factors which are more. Uh, I just talk about uh, some um, uh, the, the traditional risk factors, but there are some novel risk factors. Uh, they are also important, perhaps not as important as traditional risk factors, but we need to know about them. I will very briefly talk about them. Uh, homocysteine level correlates with coronary artery disease. Uh, I think that is important. Then having infection in the recent past with chlamydia pneumonia could also increase the risk of developing an acute MI. Inflammation of any type, inflammation due to some chronic infection or inflammation due to some chronic uh, autoimmune disease, or I think this could also be the, a contributory factor. Then C-reactive protein is actually a marker of inflammation, so that would be counted as a risk factor. Fibrinogen level, because that could contribute in the clot formation, and then vitamin D deficiency. This is relatively new finding. Uh, vitamin D deficiency is very common and in some studies it has been shown that vitamin D deficiency also increases your risk. Now let's talk about these important risk factors one by one. First of all, dyslipidemia. And what is dyslipidemia? It is any type of abnormality in your lipid profile. And lipid profile consists of these components. And we typically advise lipid panel or lipid profile in the fasting state. It is usually not an emergency to have this test done. Although now we know that most important factor is LDL cholesterol and that is not much affected uh, with meal. Uh, but our traditional approach is to ask the patient to go for lipid panel in the morning in the empty stomach for about 16, 14 to 16 hours. Now, these are the components, total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, VLDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and then non-HDL cholesterol. Most laboratories will give these values. Now, out of these, LDL cholesterol is perhaps the single most important. Now, that is why I have uh, bolded it in red and LDL cholesterol. If you just want to be have a simple approach, you could just have LDL cholesterol. Now, you know, LDL cholesterol has got different goals. Now, uh, these are the desirable LDL C values. In low risk people, like just normal people who have 10 years uh, risk of developing coronary events less than 10%, it should be less than 130 milligram per deciliter. And those who have moderate risk, moderate risk is defined as having a risk of 10 to 20 percent in next 10 years. And one example is diabetes. Having diabetes gives you a moderate risk. And I think it is recommended that LDL cholesterol should be less than 100. And if you have, if you fall in a high risk patient, uh, that means if you already have some kind of coronary artery disease, ischemic heart disease, then your LDL should be less than 70 uh, milligram per deciliter. And there is a group relatively uh, lately defined and very high risk group, those patients who have ischemic heart disease but have some further complication, uh, chronic kidney disease or heart failure, in them uh, the LDL goal is 55. 
Now, please note down there is different value for different people, different uh, groups. So we will try to achieve these goals depending upon what type of individual we are treating. If there is some person without any additional factors, our goal should be less than 130. But depending upon the group, we would aim a different uh, goal. HDL cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol is actually atherogenic, but HDL cholesterol or HDL lipoprotein is protective. Having high HDL means protection against coronary artery disease. This is because HDL actually brings LDL back to the liver, so reducing serum level. I think that is the reason. And genetically, South Asians have relatively uh, low HDL cholesterol. And then triglycerides is important because one fifth of triglyceride is cholesterol. So if you have very high triglyceride, that would be risk factor. Now there is a new approach that instead of going for all these, you just measure non-HDL cholesterol. That means everything is bad except the HDL cholesterol. So you make to calculate non-HDL cholesterol. I think uh, although this is a new concept, but currently we focus on LDL cholesterol. So I think that remains important. Now, metabolic syndrome X. Now, this is an interesting condition. This is actually a constellation of multiple factors which might have a common phenotype or common genotype. Apparently, there are different factors, there are different uh, conditions, but when they occur together, we call it metabolic syndrome. Uh, for example, having waist in men more than 40 inches and in women more than 35 inches. Now, this is given by National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, uh, the American Heart Association. There are various definitions of uh, this metabolic syndrome and some would actually say that 35 in men and 32 in women. That is also the figure, but I think uh, we may follow just the standard waist in circumference more than 40 inches in men and more than 35 in women. Please note down, this is not the, your trousers waist. This is actually measured at the level of umbilicus. Uh, when patient is standing, relax, you use a measuring tape and, uh, and, and you take the measurement, okay? So 40, 40 in uh, less than 40, uh, sorry, if it is more than 40 in men and if it is more than 35 in women, you have fulfilled one and perhaps the most important criteria of uh, metabolic syndrome. Then HDL in men, if it is less than 40 and in women, if it is less than 50 a milligram per deciliter. So that will fulfill another criteria triglycerides more than 150. Now please note down, uh, many people have 160, 170, 180 triglyceride. We sometimes ignore this type of value, but it would be countered in metabolic syndrome. Uh, so let any value more than 150, it is fasting. When it comes to triglyceride, it has to be fasting. Now, blood pressure more than 130 systolic and more than 85 diastolic. Again, I would like to withdraw your attention. More than 130 and more than one, uh, more than 85 would not be necessarily a hypertensive person. It is on the higher side of normal range. But somebody having 138 systolic and 88 diastolic will be classified as normal tensive, but will be counted here as as a one of the components of metabolic syndrome. And then blood sugar fasting more than 100. Again, you know, diabetes is defined when blood sugar exceeds 126. So more than 100 and less than 126 uh, would be counted. Uh, of course, more than 126 will also be counted. But 105, 110 may be considered normal, but it will not be considered normal when we are uh, discussing metabolic syndrome. All these factors are important. This one is most important. If you have this factor plus maybe two more, you qualify for the label of metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is the single most important predisposing condition for coronary artery disease. Now, 
all these levels are to be measured or if somebody is on medication then whatever level they have then that will be counted right so that it's obviously if somebody's blood pressure is less than that but he's on medication that will still be counted here as component of metabolic syndrome now this is just a screenshot to show you that we have many risk calculators available i was just mentioning to calculate the 10 year risk uh, it could be any any number Framingham coronary heart disease risk calculator there are many other risk fact calculator you just follow and it's a very simple app downloadable and you enter the details like you could enter male or female by default they have put the female age as you could just give any range whichever range it's not the precise age here but you arrange and then the total cholesterol and hdl cholesterol blood pressure a patient is diabetic yes or no and the 10 years is, is calculated now this is a dynamic thing you could have a certain risk now and if uh, you calculate after three years four years the risk may be different so it's a dynamic thing and you should make your long-term strategy based on your patient's uh, existing risk pathogenesis uh, i think this was briefly discussed but uh, let me just explain it again we have risk factors risk factors lead to atherosclerosis and atherosclerosis then felt ultimately because of atherothrombosis there may be clot formation uh, the first of genetic and acquired risk factors some risk factors are gen genetic others are acquired and then there are some genetic and acquired protective factors also we do not know much about this component but we know that two people with the same level of risk factors one may develop heart attack other may not develop heart attack because perhaps there are some protective factors also which we do not uh, understand very well yet so, so these risk factors collectively and depending upon how many risk factors you have there would be damage to the vessels and the damage starts from the endothelial surface there is the endothelial dysfunction and damage ultimately there is penetration of LDL particles especially highly atherogenic small dense LDL particle formation of foam cells which is just macrophages converting into fat cells and they are covered by fibrous cap this is just normal atheroma not causing much of trouble maybe a little bit of angina but not not much problem but then there is inflammation so both things are important the atherosclerosis and that inflammation inflammation can occur anytime uh, and simple throat infection is an inflammation and if you have an atheroma uh, and especially the atheroma is unstable then it could rupture and it could lead to exposure of the raw surface which would attract platelet and the clot formation so i think that was uh, briefly mentioned earlier also but i have explained it again timeline uh, this is it so normal vessel very little uh, thickening of the intima more thickening than rupture than leakage of then material which attracts platelet and at this stage one would develop uh, maybe acute angina uh, unstable angina but at this stage one would develop complete infarction and this is how things develop risk factors leads to plaque formation then inflammation rupture thrombus formation and acute coronary syndrome acute coronary syndrome we have a separate lecture on now prevention there are various types of uh, prevention possible uh, i think i will talk about the population groups and methods the population groups mean that what type of population we are uh, addressing now it could be normal like primary prevention would mean that every member of the society should start doing something to prevent coronary artery disease primordial uh, prevention that you you, you uh, stop it from happening then there are high risk patients there are patients who have 
high risk like smokers, diabetic, hypertensive, we can address these patients specifically because then you will be focusing your resources on a smaller group. Then those who have existing ischemic heart disease, this is the most important group. Ischemic heart disease or equivalent. Uh, for example, having a TIA would be considered equivalent. So these are three population groups where we focus. Ideally, I think we should focus on every individual. But then compliance is poor in this group and we need a lot of resources. But if we focus here, then compliance is likely to be better because the individual has already suffered from a coronary event, but then the resources will also be uh, spared because we are focusing on small group. So these are the groups. Then what are the methods we can use to prevent and lifestyle changes? Uh, very, very important. There are certain uh, things in life which predispose we can prevent them uh, like smoking then risk factor modification we can identify the risk factors first and then we modify them and then the use of medication so i think very briefly we'll discuss about these uh, possibilities the lifestyle changes diet for example ideally diet should be low in saturated fatty acids and saturate, saturated fatty acids mostly come from the animal fats and carbohydrates are also important because these days we take too much uh, carbohydrate and carbohydrates are converted into fats in the body so i think one should restrict carbohydrates also and then it should be relatively rich in uh, monounsaturated fatty acids and polyunsaturated fatty acids these fatty acids they come from fish oil and also the vegetable oils of course we have to restrict the total quantity because we don't want to put on weight then rubber exercises any exercise where you do not get short of breath you do not develop oxygen debt if done for uh, extended period of time like about a minimum 150 minutes per week it could be 30 minutes every day or it could be 45 minutes five days a week but some kind of ex aerobic exercises like walking jogging cycling uh, all these things depending upon your level of physical fitness as uh, they can be done smoking cessation i think that is theoretically at least uh, most doable thing provided you have the willpower some people would need some rehab some would need some medication for help but if you have willpower you can definitely uh, quit smoking and then relaxation therapies uh, i think uh, this could be some yoga exercise some uh, saying prayers or something like that depending upon one's beliefs uh, they can be relaxation therapies can help so this is this is the lifestyle changes because you know relaxation therapy i did not mention in the risk factor but stress and this lack of adequate sleep is also a uh, known factor for coronary artery disease. Second is prevention by focusing on uh, the risk factors. We've discussed dyslipidemia. For example, somebody has hypertension. This can also be controlled. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of 61 studies of more than 1 million adults and the 12.7 year study and it has shown that just two millimeter mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure can lead to seven percent reduction in risk of ischemic heart disease mortality and ten percent reduction in risk of stroke mortality so very very important just two millimeters sustained reduction in blood pressure in real life we have people who have blood pressure like 180 110 so we have the opportunity of reducing the blood pressure by 40 millimeter mercury by 20 millimeter mercury so the benefit will definitely be much more the another factor is the uh, prevention of coronary artery disease by using statins we have number of lipid lowering drugs but statins are the most important hmg coa reductase inhibitors these are the most potent uh, i would like to mention here that a main source of cholesterol in the blood is uh, the liver uh, 
about 80% of the cholesterol in the, in the blood comes from the liver. So every person's liver has different uh, tendency to make cholesterol. Otherwise, liver may be normal, but some people's liver make more cholesterol. And we can stop by giving statins. Statins will inhibit HMG CoA reductase and they will also increase LDL receptors. So the liver cells will take up more LDL and plasma level will be reduced. Now you can see these three groups I defined earlier, primary and high risk group and secondary uh, prevention. In all three groups, there are studies and these are the names of the studies. I will not go into detail, but you can see that in every group with the use of statins, there has been very significant reduction in the risk up to about close to 40% reduction in various studies. So using statins in those patients who have dyslipidemia really help. Although in the social media, there's a lot of uh, the concerns about uh, statins, but we still consider them very, very useful drugs. Those who have dyslipidemia, they must consult their doctors and have statins. The number of them, uh, I think we will have a separate lecture on lipids. Then some drugs using aspirin. Uh, not, aspirin may not be for everyone. But those who have existing coronary artery disease, those who at, are at a high risk, uh, the sum of the studies, the very, very recent studies have shown that aspirin when used for primary prophylaxis can prevent coronary artery disease to a certain extent, but that is equal with the same level of side effects, the GIT related side effects. But we still believe that if you have a patient more than 40 diabetic, or hypertensive and that patient does not have any GA tolerability, aspirin should be used as a primary prevention also. Statins, especially if there is dyslipidemia, multivitamins because homocysteine level can be lowered with vitamins. So I think uh, most people they take multivitamin these days, but those who are deficient may be given. Then there's a concept of polypill if we have to give all these why not to give all in one pill? Uh, but this is not yet approved. Now this brings us to the summary of this uh, presentation and we basically discussed about uh, the risk factors, atherosclerosis and uh, the preventive strategies in coronary artery disease. And I think in prevention, adopt healthier lifestyle from the very beginning and then identify and control risk factors. Smoking cessation, hypertension control, diabetes control, dyslipidemic control, very, very important, and they pay you back in long term. Then aggressive secondary prevention. If somebody already had developed coronary event, of course, that is not end of life. He could still develop uh, some strategy to prevent it occurring again. And then, very interestingly, small residual risk persists. No matter what you do, some risk fact, some risk would persist, if not for any reasons, the aging. And uh, due to unknown factors, unmodifiable factors, and non-adherence. So, of course, with, with all these things, we aim to reduce the risk of coronary artery disease, but some risk will still persist. That is why we're looking for new therapies. Thank you very much for watching this video. This is the end of today's presentation. Please follow me uh, in the next three lectures on ischemic heart disease. We will be discussing chronic stable angina, acute coronary syndrome, myocardial infarction and complications. Uh, so this is Professor Azizur Rahman from Medistan. Thank you very much.